All right. Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to our little virtual event space. I'm Allie. Um, I'm sorry that I've got kind of an airline situation going on on my head here. But you know, it's 2020 and we do what we got to do. Um, if you're local, you might recognize me from the LFP location. Um, I'm so excited tonight to be introducing Diana Ma and Catherine McGee here to discuss local author Diana Ma's debut, Eris Apparently. Uh, so before we get into the fun stuff, I just want to quickly thank you guys all so much for tuning in and for buying books. Your guys' support really is what makes all of this go. Um, we couldn't do it without your support, and we really love what we do. So if you guys also love what we do, please come on in, buy copies. Um, we also, I'll be throwing a link in the chat uh, uh, that'll send you right over to where the books are. Um, we do ship, so if you're not local, you can go ahead and just buy stuff online. Um, shipping is only $350 and you get to support USPS too, so a little added bonus. Um, while you're over on the website, I definitely recommend checking out some of our other upcoming events. We're kind of getting to the end of the, you know, pre-holiday push. So we, we do have a really exciting event tomorrow and then things will definitely get really hot again in January. So keep an eye on that. Um, if you sign up for our newsletter, that will keep you completely updated on everything that's going on in the bookstore. It's just one email a week. And we'll just, you know, keep you posted who's coming through, whatever books we happen to have signed copies of, fun recommendations, blog posts, et cetera, et cetera. Or you can also follow us on all of the social media platforms. We're at Third Place Books, and we would love to hear from you. So let's see, we are going to be here for about an hour. Uh, towards the end, we will be taking questions. So if you have any questions, which I very, very much hope that you do, go ahead and throw them in the Q&A box. There is a chat box and a Q&A box. Questions in the Q&A box make it just a little bit easier for us to find them. Though in that chat box, we would love to hear your thoughts, your feelings, where you're coming from, and just, you know, anything that you've got to say. We love to hear from you. So I think that covers my housekeeping. So without further ado, Catherine McGee is the New York Times bestselling author of American Royals and the Thousands Floor Trilogy. She's been speculating about American royalty since her undergraduate days when she wrote a thesis on castle envy, the idea that the American psyche is missing out on something because Americans don't have a royal family of their own. Diana Ma is a local Chinese American author, diversity advocate and teacher whose debut YA novel, Eris Apparently, is about a young actress whose big break has her filming in Beijing, where she realizes that she looks exactly like a notorious young socialite and discovers a legacy that her parents have been protecting her from her whole life. Um, thank you guys both so much for being here. I'm so excited to see this conversation. If you need anything, give me a shout. I'll be listening. Uh, and the rest of you, I leave you in their capable hands. Don't forget to throw your questions in the box, your Q&As. We love that. And I will see you soon. Thank so, you. Diana, congratulations. So Eris apparently so came out on Tuesday, two days ago, you must be so over the moon. Um, do you wanna start by just telling us a little bit about the book and the inspiration behind it? Because you know, I'm assuming that most people in the Zoom, unless they are super readers, which we might have a few, um, you know, if, who may have already read it since Tuesday, uh, you know, are not totally familiar with the story. So just give us a little more detail about that. Right. Um, so Ellie had talked about Eris apparently being about a young actress who gets her big break in a film in Beijing and the insp a lot of the inspiration for this book came from my reading about what Chinese American actresses and actors and directors and film writers have to contend with in stereotypes of Asians on film. And I thought it would be fascinating to write a novel that was about a young actress 
who's a teen and just figuring her way in the world. And she has to think about how is she going to fight for what she believes in for authentic representation. And that was um, what started my, that's what started Gemma's character. And, um, and I've always been really fascinated by M Butterfly. So it's the, it's a play by David Henry Huang. And when I bring up M Butterfly, most people say, oh, the opera by Puccini. <laughs> And I'm like, no, 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 he actually does something really fascinating with gender and sexuality and um, ideas of Asia. Um, so I, I think that bringing those two things together, my interest in M. Butterfly and ideas of representation was what started Eris apparently. And plus it's a fun romance, which I love writing. Absolutely. Well, I, I obviously love a good romance and a good love story. <laughs> Do you, do you remember like the initial moment when an idea sparked for you? And if so, how long ago was that? Or is this something that's just been percolating for a long time? It has not been percolating for a long time. It was, <laughs> it was actually um, a very rapid process, which is not how I usually work. Um, so, um, I think the exact moment was, um, when, so I, uh, so my agent reached out to me and said, there is an opportunity, there's, um, Amula is looking for someone to write an epic romantic series. Would you be interested? This is very, this is a little bit out of your wheelhouse. It's actually a lot out of my wheelhouse because I write speculative. I write science fiction and fantasy. But I've read a ton of romances. And, um, and so I said, I would love to. And when I started thinking about it, an epic romance, I really, I was really drawn to M Butterfly because it has, um, for those of you who don't know the play, it doesn't have any um, lead female roles. So I just, I thought of what would it be like for a young actress to get a call saying, you got a lead in a remake of M Butterfly. And there's a moment of confusion. Of how could I, a cisgender woman, get the lead in M Butterfly? What would that involve? And then I just started thinking about how um, the gender politics would be um, around sexuality and around race. And then I started thinking about ideas of how Asian women are viewed um, as pretty much very submissive, very flat. And I thought about what it would be like for a young actress to have that journey into figuring out not only herself and who she is, but how to play a role. So you, this brings up a great topic because you just, you touched on, on gender and sexuality and race. Um, I know that obviously this year, diversity has been a huge discussion in the world at large and very much in the YA community. Mm -hmm. I know you played a large role in this in We Need Diverse Books as, I believe, as a mentee, yeah. right? Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Yeah, thank you so much for asking about that. I love talking about We Need Diverse Books. It's a fantastic organization. I knew about We Need Diverse Books first as an educator because they are so amazing about trying to make classrooms more diverse, bookshelves more diverse, and really getting creators of children's books, um, diverse uh, creators of children's books into classrooms so that kids can see themselves reflected in the stories they read. So in, I think it was October, 2018, I had been, um, I'd been querying um, a book for agent representation and not quite getting anywhere. And I saw a notice um, on the We Need Diverse Books uh, website that they were offering a 2019 mentorship program where they would pair mentees uh, with marginalized identities 
with established children's book writers as a mentor for an entire year, um, talking about issues of what it's like to work with a book industry that is predominantly white, what it's like to, um, to write uh, the stories from our lived experiences and getting um, feedback on our manuscripts as well. And I thought, well, this is a long shot because I'm sure that so many people are applying, but it just sounded like a fantastic opportunity. So I applied, I think it was just a day before it closed. I sent in um, my application and my synopsis and a sample. And I still remember that day, it was in January, I opened up my email and there was an email from We Need Diverse Books saying I had been, um, I had been assigned a mentor that I had actually gotten into that program. And it was such a joy to work with um, Swathi Avashti and she was amazing. So talking to another BIPOC woman author about her journey and um, and what it was like for her to get her books out into the world was incredibly helpful. And that just really started the ball rolling. Oh, Catherine, I think you're muted. Oh, that's okay. Say, okay, so in so that was such a role reversal for you because in normal life you are a teacher and so you were in this instance in the role you know as mentee um you know being much more of a student yeah. i feel i'd love to hear kind of how both um you know how everything you learned through this mentorship played into your experience with publishing the book you know how did it feel as a debut author of a ya romance obviously you have written other things before but this is its own its own arena, and um, and as you said earlier, you know you were you were taking on a new genre with with rules that you might, even though you read a lot of romance, it's just it's always different writing something new. Um, you know how how did your experience being a mentee play into that, and what as a debut author, what has surprised you about the publishing process? Wow, those are all great questions. <laughs> I'm going to start with um, one of the things that was so amazing about working with the We, Ni we Need Diverse Books program and um, with Swathi in particular is that I got an MFA. So when I went through the MFA program, it was completely different. Um, children's book weren't really you couldn't get an MFA in writing children's books. So it hadn't even occurred to me that um, I could write the books I really loved. So, and I also, it was the program I went to, um, it, was, it was a long time ago, so things may have changed since then, but it was very white. And in the workshops, I would get feedback like, what if you made your main character white? Just kind of offhand, like try that on. And there wasn't ever a recognition that, um, that well, I didn't want to, <laughs> and that it was um, the whole point was writing about a main character who was like me, um, a main character who was Asian and Chinese. So um, working with um, this mentorship program with Swathi was like getting the MFA I never had. So, and that I always craved and wanted. So um, I, I loved it. It was so validating of my work. And, um, and being a teacher, I learn so much from my students. In this time of pandemic, when we're closed off from so many people, I have been incredibly lucky to retain this community at the college where I teach, where I can connect with colleagues. Um, and it's North Seattle College, by the way, is where I am. And, um, and my students there are amazing. And I, they are, um, most of them are young adults and they are way more savvy around ideas of gender and sexuality and race than I was at that age. 
So I am constantly learning from them. And in creating Gemma, I wanted someone, I wanted a character who had the savvy that my students have. Um, and while I'm at it, I need to apologize to my students. I don't know what I was thinking when I assigned a major essay uh, during my launch week. I assigned, it was due midnight on Monday. Um, and so I have not finished grading them. It's going to be a while. <laughs> Oh my gosh, you definitely don't have time to be grading right now. <laughs> oh, and I'm so sorry to my students, but I just wanted you to know that I have been doing some reading and they are amazing. These essays are so good. I hope you offered your students extra credit for tuning in. I hope some of them are watching and maybe even more extra credit for going <laughs> and writing reviews online. <laughs> I didn't offer them extra credit for that, but I did let them know that I was going to be speaking tonight. Um, they're, they're sharing their stories with me of, um, of oppression and privilege and the, in such honest and thoughtful and moving ways that I, um, I only hope that Gemma's story is as powerful as theirs. Wow, that's so powerful what you said about your initial MFA program and the feedback that you got. And it actually makes me think of something I've heard Jenny Han say in interviews, which was that, um, that to all the boys that I've loved before, you know, could have been a TV show many years ago, but the producers insisted on, um, you know, on making the main character white and she refused to, to accept that change. Yeah. And, and because of that, you know, it was delayed by a decade or however long it was. And, and then she ended up being so glad that she stuck it out and, and insisted on the vision that she had seen for it so that she saw the representation that she wanted to and, and, mm -hmm. and showed other young women, you know, a, a main character who looks like them. Right. And, and I feel like that's just so powerful. And so I, you know, I, I'm so glad that you, and I'm sure you are too, that you stuck with it and, and told this story. And something else that it reminds me of is, um, Nicolune often says that she, that it's important that, that young women and readers who are people of color are seeing stories that aren't that are romance stories or adventure stories or that aren't about race with like big capital letters but rather are just good stories well told and where race certainly plays in in a way but but is not the main heavy focus of the story and i feel like you have obviously done that with eris apparently there is so much in it and it's so rich but also it's a romance and it's a coming of age story and it's a travel story and an adventure and, and there's Hollywood and there's so much in it that, you know, is, is fun. And um, it, it, that is sparkly is a word that I use a lot just to mean that like it, you know, it's enjoyable to read. It makes you smile. It may, it, it turns the pages. And I feel like you've done that so well. Did, was that something that you did consciously or, you know, when you brought all those different elements in, like what kind of story, did you set out to tell? Yeah, I think you're absolutely right that it is, um, what a world that we live in that for a character of color to have a happy, joyous experience is radical, but it is. Um, and I wanted so badly for Gemma to have this adventurous story. I wanted a character who had a story where she had so much fun and adventure and romance and just all that good stuff that when I was, um, when I was reading romances as a kid, I was desperately searching for that story, that story where a Chinese American girl, and again, this is a long time ago, so there's so much out there right now. But when I was a kid, um, I, there really weren't those stories of um, Asian girls just getting to have those amazing fun adventures. So for Gemma, I think there's conflict and there's struggle. Um, and I think that race always has to be a part of her experience and something she's very conscious of. 
and it's um and she is and as i said she's a she's a way savvier character than i was um at her age about race um and the intersectionality of race and gender and um and sexuality but i feel that for her it's um it's automatic so she's always analyzing through that lens of um race as she's going through her world, but it's it's just so much a part of her world. It's not this like heavy thing. It's just what she does to be authentically herself. Yeah, I, I love that. I think that's so powerful. And I think, again, you know, romance is a genre that um, people use that word to describe so many types of books. And I think it's it's all about relationships and and every story at the end of the day is about relationships and um, and you've done that so well. So I kind of want to ask, because I didn't actually know until tonight that your other books are science fiction. I, I assume the world building is so different and tricky. Just how, you know, how was it? Um, do, do you feel like you brought anything from that experience to this story? Were there, were there tricks? or approaches that you use that like crossed the genres or did it feel like a totally different type of writing to you? It was, well, um, the science fiction I was writing and uh, the fantasy I was writing all, they were all YA. So I feel like the voice is very similar in that it's all about a young person with all this potential and possibility in front of them and they are ready to change their world. And I see that so much in my students. They are there, they are protesting, they are activists, they are ready to change the world in whatever way they can. Um, and so I feel that, um, so in the books I've written before, I had a protagonist who really, want, who really wants to, um, and I'll just let you know that this, I don't know if this book will ever be out in the world. It's um, its speculative, near future, slightly dystopian, and no one wants to read dystopian right now. So, um, <laughs> and I understand, trust me, I'm reading nothing but fluffy <laughs> stuff as well. So I get that. But um, so even though Gemma's world is not a dystopian world, it's a very, uh, real world with obstacles that she needs to change. So I feel that in that way, they were very similar. Right. Well, dystopian is really, it's really just our world with all the problems of our world heightened to a very, very, very extreme degree. Mm -hmm. So if you paired it back in a, a lot of dystopian novels, you would kind of circle back to our world, which is why it resonates with us so much. Right, right. Um, I'm always curious to hear about other authors writing techniques and processes, especially authors who have MFAs, even if it was a different, you know, even if you were writing not necessarily this type of book, because I feel like there are so many approaches to writing a novel. And I'm sure of some of the people who are tuning in right now, at least one or two of them is an aspiring writer and would love to hear about this. For instance, I am very much a plotter. I am an outliner. I, my books have multiple characters and I'm always writing on my whiteboard and crisscrossing chapters. Are you more of a plotter or are you more of a pantser as in that you write you know, by the seat of your pants for those who aren't familiar with the term? Like, do you just open sky, you know, op open the blank word document and go or how much, how much do you plan ahead of time? My answer is going to shock my students because um, when I teach writing, I'm all about, okay, first we're going to do the brainstorming then we're going to do the pre-writing i'm going to show you three different ways of pre-writing you pick one now we're going to do the outline make sure you do this in the outline and then this is how it will be organized but i am a pantser um, so i hear the voices in my head um not in a joan of arc kind of way but in a the characters are in my head kind of way and um, so I open up that blank work do word document and I start writing. 
But with Eris, apparently it was different um, because there was a um, there was a time crunch. And I want to say my amulet team has been amazing and how how supportive they have been and how quickly this whole process has been um, in getting Eris apparently out into the world. It was very, very fast. Um, but because of that, I had to outline for the first time. Um, and it was, um, and they really um, helped me with that because there was so much of um, plotting. And I wish I had outlined um, my previous novels now. Now that I have outlined, I am a believer. Um, because I had so many false starts with my previous novel and I had, I think it must have been um, like 500 pages at one point, my first novel. I was like, this is not a YA novel. <laughs> this, is, this is not going to work. So I've had to cut and revise and completely take it apart and put it back together. And it was just, just torturous um, experience. So now I believe in outlining. <laughs> well, better to have 500 pages than zero pages because it's That's always, always easier to cut down than to start from scratch but um that's what people say it is incredibly painful <laughs> to cut i'm just like eh, no do you have any scenes that you lost that you are just quietly crying in your heart that you know like any like what's the what's the highlight reel of the deleted scenes that you know you would wish you could have slipped back into the book I saw your post, Did, um, you had posted about, does anyone else wish that you could have deleted scenes like they do in a film? Yes. And yes. I remember thinking, yes, why do we not have that? I posted that online actually. <laughs> <laughs> Did you really? I didn't see that. Yes. Was it from Majesty or? It was from Majesty. It was through, uh, through the Bad on Paper podcast. They asked for it. And so I got permission my publisher to release it through them so like that so they released it for me which was a lot of fun it was a deleted Sam and Marshall scene which is oh. basically a romance scene for those who don't know my characters so as again we all we all want more romance just another kiss <laughs> in case there weren't enough in the book I I will need to look into that um yes there let, let me try to think um, most of the scenes that were deleted from Eris apparently were ones that needed to go. And actually all of them were ones that needed to go. But the one that I um, am a little sad about is a bad date with, um, with Ken um, or an awkward date with Ken. Um, and I don't know if I want to say any more about that, but I think that I, I really had to condense the Ken parts, but that was a really fun relationship to write because there were so many um, awkward moments and awkward scenes are always really fun to write. And their meet cute was so fun. Oh, thank you. <laughs> so speaking of Ken, and I feel like there are so many great supporting characters in the book. Um, do you wanna tell everyone without giving any spoilers away just briefly about the characters and you know, did you have a favorite one to write? Like, was there anyone whose scenes popped up? You know, they, they entered the story and you got really excited about them. For instance, I frequently get really excited at my Daphne chapters. She's actually my villain, but they, they're just always the easiest to write. Like, was there anything like that for you? Well, it's funny that you bring up the Daphne character as um, the villain that's fun to write because villains are fun to write. Um, all the Jake scenes, um, were very easy to write and very fun to write because I do think of Jake as a villain and um, and the interactions with Gemma and Jake I think was just so much fun because he has no idea what to do with her and she is just like and she sees right through him she sees right through his BS and his white male entitlement and um, and does not let him get away with anything. But also Ken was fun to write because um, he's that random hot guy that just appears in 
um, in a novel. And it was really important for me that that random hot guy be Asian because I wanted as many Asian characters in this novel as possible. Um, and the side characters, the, yeah, random hot guy who's Asian. So this, the way you just said that makes me think about some of the discussion that I heard a few years ago when Crazy Rich Asians, the movie came out. <laughs> and I'm sure you've probably had comparisons of your cover, which is amazing, to the Crazy Rich Asians covers. Mm -hmm. My, I get those too, because I also have a heavily illustrated cover with a girl in sunglasses on the front. Um, so inevitably it gets compared to the Kevin Kwan books. Do you, um, do you feel, you know, how, do you love those books? Did you read them? Do, how do you feel about the movie? How do you feel like Eris apparently kind of fits into that larger discussion about Asian representation in Hollywood, which it gets, certainly is not owned by Crazy Rich Asians, but I feel like very much was brought to the forefront by that movie. I absolutely have read the Crazy Rich Asian series and have watched the movie and, um, and have actually, I referenced Crazy Rich Asians in the book. Um, there is, there's a story that I read about, um, which I referenced in um, one of the scenes with uh, Gemma and Eileen. Oh, that's another pairing I really love, Eileen. Um, and I wonder now actually if that comes out of my, uh, my being a mentee with We Need Diverse Books um, because Eileen Dan is uh, Gemma's mentor. So she is this older uh, Chinese actress turned director and she is mentoring Gemma through, um, uh, through this Hollywood world and she's the co-director on the film. And there is a moment when they are talking, Eileen and Gemma are talking and um, Eileen brings up Michelle Yeoh, um, who plays uh, Eleanor Park in the Crazy Rich Asians movie. And um, and there, and it's Michelle Yeoh, so she can do anything. And everyone She's just, amazing. yes, <laughs> whatever you want. <laughs> um, so she said, she, when she was offered the part of Eleanor, um, Eleanor Park, she said something along the lines of, I will do it, but I want, um, I want this character to change so that she's not a tiger mom. Um, and so that was this, and I don't know if I had, before I read that story, I don't know if I had read that before of an Asian um, actress able to confront a stereotype right on and say, I won't play this, I want it changed. And because she's Michelle Yeoh, everyone said, done, we are changing this character. And I have to say, when I read Crazy Rich Asians, I had a discomfort with the Eleanor Park character because she was very much that tiger mom, um, very controlling, um, very much pushing her children towards success. And the way that Michelle Yeoh played her in the movie was just so much more nuanced and full. And um, I, I loved that character. And that, that was another inspiration. It was thinking about actresses being able to have that, um, that influence. Absolutely. It's interesting that you say that. I She's such a fabulous actress. And she's I really for whatever reason, what I took away from her performance, which maybe speaks to her, was less Tiger Mom and much more just old school snobbery, which I feel like crosses all cultures. Like she reminded me much more of a character out of an Edith Wharton novel or a Jane Austen novel, frowning at the parvenu in society than, um, than like a stereotypical Tiger Mom kind of pushing her kids to apply to good colleges, if that makes sense. I, I think she really did she really took on so many different, um, as you said, so much richness and, and such a variety of, of emotions and, and connotations in that role that it definitely, it became so much more than a one dimensional. Oh, absolutely. Yes. And it was the way that she had, um, so the, everyone involved rewrote her part. So the Eleanor Park we saw on screen was di very different from the Eleanor Park that um, Kevin Kwan created. Very true. Yeah. 
So I touched on this briefly earlier, but I would love to hear a little bit more about your cover because it really pops. The colors are amazing. The image is amazing. Uh, did you, how do you feel, you know, about it? Like, what was your role in the process? Did you get to give feedback on any early mood boards or anything, or did you just get really lucky? My role was saying, wow, yes, please, that. <laughs> so um, I had very little to do with it. They, um, they sent it to me and said, what did you, what do you think? And of course, the only possible reaction was, I love it. <laughs> and um, they did, you know, they did play around a little bit with it. Um, but um, so I'm trying to think of the original that they sent me, but I, I didn't have anything to do with the changes that were made. They just sort of did that on their own. I think the first cover they sent, which was um, more, it had blues and hot pinks and it was really cool. And I said, I love it. And they sent this and I said, I love this too. So, um, um, oh, I will say one thing, which was really fun because a colleague of mine caught me in my office as I was scrolling through 80s fashions. Um, so um, as, one does. <laughs> as one does. And I um, I hope my dean isn't listening right now. <laughs> it wasn't during office hours or class time. But um, anyway, <laughs> I was scrolling through 80s fashion because they were asking, so what do you think of some 80s fashions as a teaser to the next book? And that's all I will say about that. That is super exciting, which brings me is a great transition to my last question, which is um, what are you working on now? Or can you tell us about your next project? It sounds like it's the next book. It is the next book. Um, the, this is a series. And so Eris apparently is the first in the series. And it was required um, as a trilogy? Is that? We're not sure yet. How many, okay. Um, so there is definitely one more book at least. Okay. Um, and quite possibly more. But um, the next book is going to be, um, not sure how much I can say about it, but it will be, um, it will be Lay's story, Gemma's mother's story. Oh, that's so fun. Yeah. I, I am speaking from experience when I say I know how hard it is to write a second book there may or may not be a third <laughs> it is very tricky because you are I'm trying sorry. to close doors but also leave them all kind of cracked open so that you can get back in should you need to so um so good luck how where are you in the process when's your next deadline <laughs> I have a mental note in my head that I'm going to just break um where I was not going to ask you if there was by any chance going to be a third book in your series. But I just want to put out there that I would read it and be thrilled for a follow-up. But and that's all I was saying. I'm in the same position you are where I'm I'm waiting for news from my publisher. So I I also wrote, as I said, Majesty, which is the second book in the American Royal, is um very much ends in a good place that I feel really excited about, but you know, I, I should not say this, but I am on the on the Zoom, which it's not where I pictured Endgame for everybody, and I purposefully didn't go there because I I I think there's a there's a possibility and hopefully a good one that there will be another book, <clears throat> and so I wanted to give myself room to come back in because if I ended in a very, very definitive ending, right. I don't know where, how, how I would continue the story. Right. So I very much ended in a place that like, if this is where the series ends, I feel good about it. Right. I'm happy with where the characters are, but is there, is there the room for more narrative wise? Absolutely. And, um, and we'll see. So, you know, I, I have a fantastic editor and she is hopeful that we can make it happen. But um, as you know, from, from working, you know, from now having gone through the publishing process start to finish, it's, it can be slow. I know your writing process sounds like it was really fast, but it, these things can take time. And so yeah, absolutely. we're waiting to see. And in the meantime, I have been very distracted with my 
small human and <laughs> have not had a lot of work done lately. <laughs> You're adorable small human. He's very small right now. We, he was here <laughs> before, before the um, event started. So, oh, we had a few um, really fun rapid fire questions I was gonna ask and then I'm opening it up to questions from um, from all the attendees. So please continue to put them in the Q&A box and, and we will get to them. I'm super excited. Um, so quick, quick questions. What is the last TV show you binged, which we all need TV show recommendations right now? All right. I just have to say, this is so embarrassing, um, but I'm going to be honest. <laughs> Taking a deep breath. Um, married at first sight. <laughs> It's oh, it, not where I saw this going. <laughs> I know. Love it. Love it is a train wreck that I cannot look away from. And um, it's a reality uh, it's a reality TV show masquerading as a social experiment. And so they have like experts and everything. But it's really a reality TV show train wreck. And I have so many feelings about the couples. And I'm um I've just watched the entire first season and I was screaming at my TV, Monet, do not let him gaslight you. Get out, run. <laughs> but um <laughs> the best parts of um Married at First Sight, the moments that I'm just like watching with absolute envy is when there's always um there's always a scene in the season where the the woman gets together with her girlfriends and they go out and they're really close to each other and they're hugging each other and they're drinking wine and they're out in public and i miss my girlfriends so much and i want to be out in a bar drinking wine with them um and touching them and holding them and so that is the part of Married at First Sight that I am just, it's not the honeymoon, um, it's not the beaches, it's the, it's the moment when the, um, when the girlfriends come over with wine and they talk. I love that. We could all use a group hug right now. Yeah. It's so funny, you're not the first author who I've talked to who um, really draws upon reality TV for escapism. I think I'm missing out on, I don't watch almost any reality TV but um, but maybe I need to get on that. I've been binging the new season of The Crown, which is so, so oh. fun. Um, what about last last book you read or just book recommendation, particularly a YA? Like what's your what's your most recent favorite YA that you've read? The most uh, recent YA I read was Spin the Dawn by Elizabeth Lim. It is a fairy tale retelling, and I think it's marketed as a Mulan retelling, but I don't see it so much as a Mulan retelling. It's more of um, a Grimm's fairy tale retelling, All the Furs, with a princess who escapes her um, castle. But it's 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 a story of a tailor um, and a female tailor who dresses up as a man in order to um, gain recognition. But there's all this, there's all this wonderful stuff about um, spirits and magic and it's just wonderful. I love it. It's so, it's so good. Um, and then I was saying to Allie before we started because I feel like this is information that everyone should have and I'm a little bit resentful. I did not have this information until now. It's not YA. But I want everyone to know that Stacey Abrams writes romance novels under the pen name Selena Montgomery. Did you know that? No, I only I found not. out recently. So, um, so I, uh, so I have one of her books, and I haven't started it yet, but I'm so excited. That was a valuable public service announcement. Thank, Thank you. you. I just want to make sure everyone knew that. <laughs> yes. Um, are you a coffee drinker or a tea drinker? What's your caffeine of choice? Coffee. Same. <laughs> you, gotta, you gotta get through the day somehow. Right. Um, and sweet or savory, what's your go-to writing snack? Um, savory because if it's something sweet, I want to be able to savor it and I can't savor something sweet while I'm writing. Yeah, that's fair. I know, I feel like my writing snack is like bags of candy, which is awful. <laughs> um, 
Um, okay, so there are so many great questions from, um, from the audience. One that came up a couple of times, which I also want to hear, is how do you balance everything? You, someone was like, you read a lot of books and you teach and you're writing, like what, what does your writing structure look like day to day or how do you make it all happen? So I sit down in front of the computer, which is out in the open between my six-year-old's bedroom and my 11-year-old's bedroom. And I am writing with the background of mom, 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 he's hitting me again. And I am just writing and saying, I'm just going to finish the scene. And if no one is dead by the end of the scene, I will call that a win. So, um, so that's your writing soundtrack, not music, but the cries of mom. <laughs> I have a writing soundtrack, but I never get to listen to it in, in pandemic time. Oh, uh, I know. It's so funny. I actually feel like I need, I need a silence to write, um, but occasionally, but then I like use music in breaks for sure. That would certainly be my preference to have silence. Yeah. Um, someone else, Lindsay asked, did you need to do any research while writing Eris apparently? And if so, did you learn anything that surprised you? Oh, so much research. Um, yeah. Um, so I had a, um, I had a pretty good grounding in the, in the M Butterfly play, which is, which underlies a lot of the, um, the plot. And, but I had to do, um, I had to do a lot of research into um, the Chinese firewall, that's the internet firewall and how to get around it. Because in China, you, um, you have to have a, I forget what it stands for, the VPN, something virtual, something network in order to access um, Instagram or Facebook um, or social media. And um, so I had to figure out how would one get it? And, um, and that was information I didn't have. The last time I was in China was a long time ago. It was before all of this. So there was definitely that. There was um, some historical research I had to do. Um, and, um, and there were some phone calls to my parents where I was, where I had to ask them. I, I have a phrase that you have said that you have um, said all my life, but I just need to make sure that I'm using it correctly. So they were able to help me with some of the Chinese. That's amazing. Yeah. And, and um, have, so have your parents read the book? My mother has read it. I was a little nervous um, because I gave away uh, her secret ingredient for her recipe for mooncakes and she makes the best mooncakes in the yeah. world um but when I told her that her response was so perfect I love her response so much I so I confessed to her I was like you it was okay that I gave away your secret ingredient she was like oh it's fine even when I give people a recipe they can't make it as well as I can <laughs> so which is yeah, it's true touch Right. She has exactly. I knew you were going to say that. I was like, it, it, cause it works like that. You can, you have a recipe from someone who does something perfectly and you're like, there's something, it's never quite the same as when they make right. it. Yeah. Uh, we got a couple of amazing questions um, that are very thoughtful about race and how you handled race in the book. For instance, Michael, who I think is a student of yours, because Michael says, something I remember you touching on a lot in your lectures is the value of own voices in fiction. Do you feel like there's a disparity between characters of color as written by people of color versus those at, written by white authors? Oh, absolutely. Um, thank you, Mike. And if you're the Mike I'm thinking of, thank you for not asking a question about the Star Wars prequels. Um, so later. <laughs> the, um, so I, I feel that these 
images, if you don't have the lived experience, all you can reach for are the images that are out in Hollywood, which are the um, controlling images, the very flat stereotypical images, because that's what permeates the, the air we breathe. It's, it's just what is around us in popular culture. But if you have the lived experience, then you can get into the specificity. So it's not just about being aware of a stereotype and breaking it, but it is um, about creating a full nuanced character um, from my experience. So I feel that when I write Asian characters, these are from my lived experience. They're not perfect. They're not about breaking a stereotype. They are about um, living their lives. And my job, I think, is to portray that life as fully as possible, even if they are fictional. Um, similarly, Alice asked about, she said, thank you so much for writing a book with an Asian female main character. Representation is so important. How do you deal with pushback from editors or other stakeholders who ask you to change certain characteristics or traits that pertain to ethnicity and culture? Or, or maybe you didn't have any pushback. I, I actually would love to hear, you know, were there things that were edited or, or that people asked you to edit that, um, that they shouldn't have asked you to change? Thank you. I was really lucky in this regard. I think my editor um, was amazing. Um, so I think she was really clear that even though this was a, um, this was a concept that was in many ways pitched to me, um, she said, this is your story. You write it in the way that makes sense to you. Um, so I definitely felt very supported around that. Um, I felt that anytime there was a suggestion for where the story would go and I had a different idea, that was immediately, um, uh, I was immediately given that power to do that. So, um, so I don't think that there was any um, pushback or you need to change the character in, in a way that did not feel comfortable to me. There were some questions I got um, and it, it wasn't from my editor. It was more from, I think it was a copywriter who had asked a question and, and it was for, um, and it wasn't as much about race as about sexuality. I think there was a moment where it felt very natural to me to write um, a character where, uh, where Gemma expresses attraction to a woman. And, but I think the copy, um, the copy editor wanted it clear, oh, then does she identify as LGBTQ or does she not? So she wanted a clear cut identification where I think that, um, where I think that young readers um, are more comfortable with not having a very binary definition of sexuality. Yeah, I, I know the moment you're thinking of, and I, um, I liked that moment. I actually thought that it felt very, it felt like that generation, exactly as you said. And then I think this will have to be our last question, which is um, how has the process of writing the book changed the way that you teach writing or the way that you teach young authors? <laughs> it has. Yeah, I feel like it's changed a lot because when I um, um, when I started teaching creative writing, I think I was coming from this very MFA world where it was about literary works. And so what I was teaching was literary works. Um, but as I've gotten like fully immerse myself in this wonderful young adult world. Um, now I go into a class and say, write whatever you want. I just want you to know that if you're writing horror, I'm not going to be a whole lot of help to you, but to go ahead and write whatever you want. Um, and my shift, it, I think the shift is that I am less concerned in a creative writing class about um, I need you to know about all these literary elements that you can incorporate and more about how do we make your character come alive? How do we have this character have a, um, 
have a powerful and engaging voice that is true to who this character is. So we do a lot more work around character. We do, um, I have them write their entire bio for this character and um, yeah. So I, I feel that I'm a lot more open to helping students write what they wanna write rather than imposing my idea of what literary work with literary merit should be. Wow, I love that. Mm -hmm. You're such, I'm sure you're such a great teacher. I want to come to <laughs> your classes now. I have been fortunate to have amazing colleagues and, um, and my students, all my students are, they're so, they're great. And um, yeah. You've definitely got a lot of students or, or colleagues in the chat because there are a lot of people who, who clearly know you personally and are very excited for you. And so, happy to celebrate your success. So even if you can't see everyone in person, you are definitely getting a lot of virtual group hug. Um, so I don't know if Allie- I'm at the chat now. And these are yeah, so I know. Go back and look at it afterwards because you'll want to read all of these. They really are so lovely and warm. Um, so I'll let Allie take it again from here, but I will close out with a reminder to buy your books from Third Place Books and especially to go buy Diana's book in her first week. If you don't know this already, um, first week sales are a really important metric in publishing and, and we love supporting authors, especially first time authors who write such amazing, wonderful, thoughtful stories. Thank you so much. It was such a delight chatting with you tonight, Catherine. It was so fun. Yes, thank you guys so much. Um, I was trying to like, I thought I was gonna be able to get something done over here. Nope, I was riveted. <laughs> Nothing done. <laughs> Thank you guys so much for being here. Um, YA events are always my absolute favorite. Um, you guys just talk about such modern and interesting and fearless things. And I just it's such a great environment to be part of. So thank you for being here. Audience, always thank you guys so much for coming out. Yes, come and buy books. We're currently open and we do ship. So come on in, say hi, let us know what you thought. And I think that about sums it up. So I guess I'm gonna say good night. Thank you guys. Thank you. Good thank night. you so much. Have a good night. Congratulations again, Diana. Thank you Bye. so much. Bye.